Are we on? All right, good afternoon. Hi, I'm Perry M. Boring. I'm the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Um, we are a trade association exclusively focused on um, issues in the digital asset in the blockchain space. We represent about 200 companies that are investing in and innovating with blockchain-based technologies. Um, thank you for joining us um, today for this briefing on AML challenges and opportunities. I um, want to give a big thanks to Congressman Foster for hosting this session today. Um, uh, Congressman Foster is uh, from Illinois, and he's one of the co-chairs of the Blockchain Caucus. Um, so with that, Congressman, I'll welcome you um, to provide the introduction and the welcoming remarks, and thanks again for having us. Well, thank you all for being here, and thanks to our panelists. I, you know, For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Congressman Bill Foster. I sometimes introduce myself as saying I represent 100% of the strategic reserve of physicists in the United States Congress. But I'm actually probably uh, also 100% of the AI programmers and actually blockchain programmers as well. My, my son and I have a, uh, a Christmas project that we do every year, um, which celebrates my teaching him software back when he was small. And so this year, we did our project for Christmas vacation, um, we made a small Python blockchain client. And so it's... Um, but so I, I'm really proud to um, to serve as the co-chair of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus and to uh, help uh, educate members and their staffs about uh, you know about this incredible technology. Um, and you know one of the first questions that's asked by policymakers on this is you know what you do about problems with uh, illicit financing, you know to what extent traceability is desirable or undesirable in different assets. And because most cryptocurrencies are pseudonymous, they can um, pose significant issues to law enforcement who are trying to follow, uh, follow the money and find the bad guys. Um, and there are different crypto assets with different levels of uh, traceability. Um, you know, some, uh, some are uh, arguably kind of traceable now, those of you who uh, pawed through the um, the indictment of the Russians that were cited and actually indicted uh, via the Mueller investigation and will realize that there is some degree of traceability um, in Bitcoin. However, there are other ones such as Monero who advertise that they're virtually untraceable. And you rapidly get into things that should not be said in public, but you know, when I had a, a, a briefing on this specific subject by the FBI last week, I just realized how advanced the cat and mouse game is on, on this with very smart cats and very smart mice uh, in the play. And, um, and so it's really important that we empower agencies like FinCEN and the FBI with the tools that they need to combat illicit financing um, without crimping the, um, you know, the revolutionary applications of, of blockchain. Um, and so I, I really believe that the good actors in this industry have... Uh, you know, they have a vested and shared interest with the policymakers in making sure that, uh, that the activities enabled by blockchain are the positive ones. And um, so I'm really excited to hear more about uh, today about how we can actually make that happen. So thank you all again and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Congressman. Um, as uh, Congressman Foster noted, um, blockchain uh, technologies and Bitcoin have proved to be uh, a boon to law enforcement. And, as, and in many cases, we have uh, many members of the chamber and different actors within the, the blockchain ecosystem that have um, worked proactively with law enforcement to address um, illicit uses um, of this technology, which we'll discuss um, more in, in the conversation. Um, we take this issue very seriously. There's a lot of great resources here in Washington, D.C., of companies and organizations like the Chamber, the Blockchain Alliance, and others um, that have put significant amount of time and attention um, into addressing these risks and also turning them into opportunities. Um, one update to our session, um, Jason Weinstein um, from Steptoe, um, who's also the director of the Blockchain Alliance, he is sick today, so he is obviously not on the panel, um, but we will send him um, our best regards, and um, John from Bitrix will talk in a little bit more detail about um, the Blockchain um, Alliance. Um, so with that, oh, and then also just want to note for those who would like a copy of our anti-money laundering guidelines, um, this paper is on the back. We just published this paper last month. Um, this was um, written in collaboration with our members 
um, and is um, a great resource both for the industry and also policymakers that are interested in the AML challenges of blockchain technology and digital tokens. Um, so next I'd like to introduce you to the Chamber's Chief Policy Officer, Amy Kim. Um, Amy runs um, the policy team at the Chamber, um, including our um, AML task force. We have a really comprehensive body of work um, in this area and uh, look forward to sharing that with you. So thanks, Amy. Thank you, and thank you, Congressman. I pre uh, appreciate your remarks, and, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, let me just quickly introduce the panelists. Um, to my right is Kevin O'Connor. He's a Compliance and Enforcement Officer with FinCEN. Um, to his right is John Roth, Chief Compliance and Ethics Officer with Bittrex. Next to him is Michelle Bond, Global Head of Government Relations with Ripple. And at the end, we have David Jevons, the CEO of CypherTrace. Really um, a panel of uh, experts who can speak to any aspect of the things that we're talking about today. I'm very excited to have this conversation. Um, you know, the development of Bitcoin using a blockchain as a peer-to-peer -peer payment service was an extraordinary breakthrough for the uh, transfer of uh, value online. Um, it solved the problem of sending anything digitally. Um, you know, if I sent you something online, how do you know that I didn't keep a copy of it? Uh, blockchain uses secure cryptography and algorithmic principles to confirm that transfers of value such as has, uh, Bitcoin have in fact occurred. And this is without the need for an intermediary such as a bank to actually have to do that for you. Um, so it's truly an advancement for online global interaction. Um, that said, because it involves value transfer that is faster, cheaper, and more secure, it naturally raises questions around protections for money laundering and illicit um, activity. This is an issue raised since its inception. Um, um, and companies and the government have become increasingly more sophisticated at identifying and stopping crime. Just last week, the Department of Justice, working with industry and others, was able to bring down the largest darknet child pornography website. And as part of that action, the DOJ stated that the use of Bitcoin um, was impl implicated in the market lace marketplace, but because um, through the sophisticated, and this is a quote, through the sophisticated tracing of Bitcoin transactions, uh, the IRS CI special agents were able to determine the location of the darknet server, identify the administrator of the website, and ultimately track down the website server's physical location in South Korea. Um, so these are important developments, I think, in law enforcement. I think we, these are things that we should be talking about. Of course, technology advances at, at a pace. Um, and so we're constantly challenged um, to, to keep up with it. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is the importance of blockchain first, just to kind of level set why we need to get this right, um, both from the financial services perspective and more broadly. And then how industry and government are using blockchain technology to progressively deter and detect criminal activity. Um, so let's start just with a quick overview. Um, you know, we've got uh, several companies um, on the panel that are um, actively implementing um, technologies to enable um, transfers of value and connect um, parties um, digitally. Um, so maybe, Michelle, just to kick things off, um, you know, why is this technology so important? Why is it so groundbreaking? Thank you, Amy. Um, thanks for having me here today. I'm very pleased to talk with all of you about this exciting space. I am the global head of uh, government relations at Ripple. Ripple is a uh, is a really interesting company. Uh, so we are in the blockchain space, as you know, and what we're doing is we're uh, we've created a frictionless experience for customers to transfer value across borders. Uh, so basically, money can move across borders the same way you can access information like on the internet today. Um, so that's basically our, our business proposition. Um, the, way that we, the way that we do that is um, by using a digital asset. It's called XRP. And um, XRP is uh, the, th the third largest cryptocurrency um, after both uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And essentially, uh, it's, it's more scalable, it's more efficient, it's more cost effective, and um, it's really built for payments. And it enables a cross-border payment to occur within 30 seconds, as opposed to three to five business days um, using other networks that are out there. So um, essentially, um, 
you know, we've been operating in the regulated space since 2012. And um, we've engaged the governments um, worldwide. We, we're actually actively engaged with 50 different governments. And we're making sure to comply with all AML, um, BSA, um, CFT, and other requirements. Um, our company, I, I, I know that a lot, a lot of people have the misperception that you know blockchain is completely unregulated, et cetera. But not only um, do we have, uh, are we directly regulated, we have a um, money services business license with FinCEN. Um, we also hold a New York State Department of Financial Services bit license. Um, but we are not consumer facing in any way. And that means that the entities that we partner with, particularly who use RippleNet, our global system for cross-border payments, those entities are all financial institutions that are regulated. So they're regulated banks and they're regulated payment providers that all have their own um, you know, AML, uh, FinCEN requirements. So we very much operate within the regulated framework. Um, as far as, uh, you know, there, there's obviously all of the, you know, the, the whole host of AML requirements, but I think it's also important to note that we also partner with exchanges that are also regulated as money services businesses with uh, registered with FinCEN, and then in addition to that, um, when a customer, so a financial institution, decides to onboard and use RippleNet and our liquidity solution, which is called on-demand liquidity, which is the, the, um, the software that essentially uses XRP, um, that, those, those customers, um, we, you know, Ripple conducts um, its own due diligence of our, of our customers to make sure that they are complying with their requirements, and we're also making sure that they, um, you know, they, they sign up and they use a licensing agreement with us, um, you know, to make sure that they're maintaining best practices. So, and maybe to that point, Michelle, you know, I think it'd be great to uh, level set a little bit about um, just the existing regulatory landscape um, that applies to companies like yours, but also others um, in this space. So maybe, uh, Kevin, if I could maybe turn to you as far as. Let's start with the federal side because this is a dual, um, and you mentioned too, you know, state and federal. Maybe just a little bit about um, the federal laws that apply to um, exchangers and money transmission and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you all for having me today. Uh, it's really an honor to be here and be able to speak uh, to you all about uh, this particular subject. Uh, FinCEN, uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, uh, we've actually were one of the first regulators in this space, uh, dating back all the way to uh, 2011, uh, when we changed the definition of money transmission services in our regulations uh, to encompass other value that substitutes for currency. And as a result of that regulatory change, that meant that activity conducted in convertible virtual currency uh, was covered under our money transmission, our money service businesses rules. And what that requires of uh, businesses engaged in this activity is that they register with FinCEN, that they maintain an anti-money laundering program. And one of the nuances of that that I think is very interesting is that it actually has to be written and reasonably designed to prevent the MSB from being used uh, for money laundering or terrorist finance. Uh, it imposes reporting requirements, so suspicious activity reporting and uh, currency transaction reporting if you're dealing in physical cash. And it has certain record keeping requirements that are associated with as well as uh, including the famous travel rule. And uh, in 2013, we put out guidance that sort of crystallized this framework saying that exchangers and administrators are covered uh, activity under the BSA. Uh, and we've subsequently put out a number of administrative rulings, uh, enforcement actions, uh, and most recently in May, uh, another set of guidance to further expand, uh, expand upon the uh, uh, types of businesses that might be considered money service businesses under our framework. And you know, I mean, Kevin, I, I will say that I think that industry has appreciated the fact that FinCEN was an early um, early issuer of guidance on this topic and then has, as you said, through advisory letters and other things, um, consistently followed up with you know, more fine tuning along the way, uh, which I think is a, a great model um, for regulators to take. Um, so on the, that's on the federal side. And now, you know, there is, it is, as I said, you know, kind of 
um, two parts to this um, uh, money laundering protections. Um, John, if I could just turn to you on the state side, um, it's pretty extensive regulation on the state level as well. Sure. Um, oh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> there's one button and I somehow missed that. So um, uh, never let lawyers around technology. Um, I'm a lawyer too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> clearly a better technologist than me. Um, so I'm the chief compliance officer of Bittrex, which is a Seattle-based cryptocurrency exchange whose um, mission is essentially to incubate the blockchain technology in ways that will fundamentally change how it is that we move and store not only value but also information. And that's one of the primary takeaways I'd like to ensure that people – folks have here is that this is more than simply a matter of value transfer, but it's also a matter of data storage and data transfer in very, very secure ways. It turns cyberspace from something that's inherently insecure to something that's inherently secure. So it's going to be revolutionary in how it's done. Um, it is a heavily regulated space, appropriately so. Uh, uh, Kevin talked about the federal side of it, being registered with FinCEN and having a money laundering program. I'm the chief compliance officer, so I'm responsible for our money laundering program. And to borrow Congressman Foster's uh, um, uh, phrase, I'm, I'm actually in the cat game. I'm one of the people who are, are there to catch the mice in, in association, of course, with law enforcement. Perfectly appropriate because I have a 32-year uh, uh, history with the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security. So it's a very natural transition. But to answer your question, of course, um, uh, yes, we are regulated on the, state, on the federal side as a money service business, but most states also have regulations with regard to what it is that we do because we are in the business of transferring money. So money transmission is a state regulated, inherently a, a traditionally a state regulated uh, thing, and every state has rules with regard, every state but one, has rules with regard to what money transfer looks like and how it is regulated. Every state has uh, rules that functionally not only impose their own state requirements with regard to safety, soundness, consumer protection, and privacy, but also in large part borrow the federal rules as a uh, um, sort of a force multiplier, if I may, of the federal anti-money laundering rules. So. Um, I like to say that as a compliance officer, I'm blessed with having uh, 54 different state reg or 54 different anti-money laundering regulators. So I don't think I'll be put out of business anytime soon. Well, and then there's also New York, um, who which has um, implemented what people call the Bit License, which is its own separate, in addition to its state money transmitter statute, its own separate. Um, virtual currency business activity regulation. There are a number of states with that. The state of Washington, our home state for Bitrix, has a, a similar license as does North Carolina, Vermont, uh, a number of other states have uh, crypt cryptocurrency specific licensing requirements. Um, and some fairly sophisticated folks who are doing the regulation on, on their side, so. Yep. So then, so that's the, the, the lay of the land in the U.S. Um, what's going on internationally, right? Because, you know, we see um, with many other laws, um, if you're not, a, you know, if you have something stringent in one country and not so in the other, it's very hard, especially either multinational or, in this case, digital um, companies to comply globally and expand. Um, and and I, there has been some recognition of the unevenness of that um, in the media. Um, Dave, maybe I could turn to you. You know, there's a multinational body called the Financial Action Task Force, or affectionately known as the FATF, um, that uh, puts out, um, it's a multi-governmental body that puts out recommendations with respect to AML. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, so my name's Dave Jevons, and I'm CEO of CypherTrace. We focus on cryptocurrency tracing, uh, de-anonymization, investigations, and anti-money laundering. Um, so you can imagine that in this space, cryptocurrency is global. Um, it, it, it's been the most global phenomenon I've ever seen. Money has moved around the world every second with cryptocurrencies, which is one of the great powers. But it also makes it challenging for us to uh, do investigations and uh, have compliance when every country has different sets of regulations, as well as we've heard from John, many different state ones. This organization, Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, um, is uh, based in Paris. It is a uh, it is basically funded by governments from around the world. 
They have a rotating president, so every year it's a president from a different country. So most recently the president was from the United States, from Department of Treasury. Um, so was, was the president for one year and really pushed hard to get virtual currency uh, rec recommendations and regulations for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing on an international level. So those recommendations were published at the end of June of this year. Um, it's a risk-based approach to uh, regulating virtual currencies. Now this recommendation is typically adopted within 12 to 18 months by all of the G20 nations as well as most of uh, Europe. Um, so it does have pretty broad global um, impact and will be effectively put into, into regulation in all of these countries we anticipate sometime uh, mid to late next year. Uh, what it does is it fundamentally changes the nature of cryptocurrencies. So as we heard from the Congressman earlier today, the cryptocurrencies have been anonymous or pseudonymous and companies like CypherTrace and others spoke, specialize on trying to identify that to help in money laundering controls and financial investigations. What's happening with this rule is, and, and, and the major part of it is the, what we call the travel rule, is it makes cryptocurrency look more like banking. So in banking, when we send a wire transfer, we have to send not only the amount, but we send the name of the person and the account number of who's sending it, where they're sending it from. When it's sent to the other bank, that you also have to send the beneficiary name, who is receiving it. This allows both sides to perform scans on uh, sanctioned entities, terrorists, known criminals, and block or freeze those funds, or create governmental reports. So that's what's being implemented in this so-called travel rule that the FATF is pushing out and that we anticipate will be adopted by major countries by the middle of next year. So you can imagine this is a fundamental change because there are not three cryptocurrencies or 10 cryptocurrencies or 100 cryptocurrencies. There's probably 700 active ones and over 2,000 that exist. So changing 2,000 cryptocurrencies is going to be a massive challenge. So the industry is really struggling with this. There's a lot of different approaches. Japan is coming up with their own approach that is more government driven. In the US, we're doing more of an industry approach, which is going to be consensus driven. And so we're actually facilitating a conference in, in uh, November in San Francisco to bring all these parties together just to focus on this one issue of international regulation. Mind if I build on that yeah, just really quickly? Ahead. Just uh, if you notice and you look at the way the FATF, uh, the FATF interpretive note to recommendation 15, because that's the formal location of where this is found, um, you'll notice that it looks a lot like the United States framework. And this is very much intentionally so, as Dave pointed out. Uh, you know, the U.S. was very active in getting this, uh, in getting this interpretive note published under the U.S. presidency. And that's very important because one of our biggest concerns and threats uh, from a U.S. regulatory perspective is this idea of jurisdictional arbitrage where you're going to find exchanges trying to find the you know, path of least resistance to establish their business and then potentially facilitate illicit activity. So one of our goals at Treasury and at FinCEN has been to sort of build up capacity for our international partners to help them get ready and to impose some kind of regulatory regime so that you have more consistency across these countries uh, and so that you are able to sort of push out illicit activity by having a strong regulatory framework elsewhere. And that's sort of one of the ideas that goes behind why the FATF acted the way it did, so that we could sort of build this uh, and, and have a consistent international framework. Yeah, no, I think you know, this is a very um, important perspective, especially, for, I think, for U.S. companies as well. And, and one thing to, to point out is it's not just the wire transfer rule. Um, what the FATF did this summer was really map um, a, a, a subset of specific requirements onto companies uh, well, requiring countries to implement them, which would then be imposed upon companies uh, globally. Um, so we're talking, you know, know your customer, you know, how to onboard people. It, it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than just the wire transfer rule. There's a lot more um, that looks like, I think, to Dave's point, you know, more kind of along the lines of traditional banking type expectations. Um, so we'll see. I mean, if the FATF issued last week a statement saying that if there, if a country is under, um, is being examined now for its compliance with FATF principles, um, they will uh, uh, um, examine for their progress in this space as well. 
Um, they also said some things about stable coins and other things, but that's... that's my, my observation is that uh, regulation without enforcement is useless. And I thought that their guide, that what they came out with in the last week around, you know, how the country should be measured, and that's a good step towards building enforcement. I do think we're going to have to still be wary on countries that may say they adopt these regulations, may even write them in, but have zero enforcement. And some of those are European, as we all know. Well, we also like to see some guidance, too, before, you know, enforcement is kind of a... a step of last resort, but of course it may at some point be necessary. Um, so I think that's, you know, just kind of a lay of the land as far as we've got regulation in the U.S. at the state level, the federal level, internationally there's been a lot going on in the last year culminating with this summer's um, um, adoption of regulatory principles. Um, so let's talk about how the industry is meeting these obligations. Um, one way that it's been doing it is uh, something called the Blockchain Alliance. Um, that the chamber co-founded um, and has been active for five years now, I think, maybe four, four-ish years. Um, so for some time, though, especially in this space, and, you know, John, you've been a, a, a active participant. Um, can you share with us kind of what your experience has been, and then I, I can also kind of share what we've been doing? Sure. Um, so it's really been uh, an amazing thing to see. I was sort of a latecomer. I've only been in this business for about two years. But the Blockchain Alliance started really early on in the cryptocurrency industry with this idea that there needed to be a partnership between industry and law enforcement to sort of tackle some of the unique issues that cryptocurrency has uh, with regard to, for example, tracing and anti-money laundering issues. Um, and what we found, of course, is that like the movement of traditional money, there's always a fingerprint, some sort of digital fingerprint that allows uh, uh, law enforcement to take a look at the actions of criminal, uh, criminal movement of money. And what we found actually is that the digital currency has even more fingerprints than traditional currency has. This idea that blockchain is really pseudo-anonymous is not actually true. And uh, as was mentioned earlier in this presentation, there was a child exploitation takedown last week that was just massive in scope. Uh, and the reason it was massive in scope is because the law enforcement now understands how it is that you can trace the digital fingerprint of criminal actors who want to get paid uh, for their services or who pay for illegal services. And that first started, of course, uh, with Silk Road, which was a notorious dark net market case uh, that was taken down and the leader of that got life in prison as a result of law enforcement understanding that you can trace these transactions in ways that are really unavailable in traditional um, currency or traditional financial circles. So really what the Blockchain Alliance attempts to do uh, and succeeds at doing really is having an interface between law enforcement and the industry to talk about these issues to ensure that there are there is a free flow of information, a transfer of information. I uh, speak regularly with law enforcement. Again, given my background as former law enforcement, that's a fairly natural fit, but as do other members of the industry. Um, and I, I don't think we can really talk about sort of the law enforcement aspects of this without talking a little bit more about blockchain tracing and some of the really sophisticated work that some of these blockchain tracing tools are doing. So I don't know, Dave, if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Certainly happy to, John. Uh, so this cryptocurrency tracing uh, is a challenge because, as we mentioned, it's global. There are hundreds of these now that are active. I think we're tracing about 700 different currencies now, but more, more to be done always. Um, it involves being able to monitor transactions globally, to interact with companies on a global scale, so thousands of different companies involved in cryptocurrencies, to profile their transactional activities, to understand whether they have know your customer compliance or not, because if they don't, typically that's where the bad guys go. They figure out, uh, as Kevin mentioned, regulatory arbitrage. They figure out who will let anyone in to trade, and then they go there. And that gets around on these dark web forums, so the bad guys talk. They don't have any non-disclosure agreements or anything like that, no regulatory control, so they can talk whatever they want. So bad guys figure out where to go. So it, it involves all of that. It involves 
working on uh, monitoring these dark web forums. So as you mentioned, the, the child porn one recently, but there were many drug forums, uh, weapons forums, and a lot that buy and sell stolen credit cards. So monitoring those and understanding their transactional patterns. Um, monitoring terrorist forums and their transaction patterns and how they might solicit funds through uh, both regular payments and cryptocurrencies. And then combining it into massive software systems. So for example, at our company, at CypherTrace, we have over a thousand servers that are running 24 hours a day, computing this data, gathering it all, uh, linking it together. So it, it's a very complex technical problem, but it's also a trade craft uh, problem. Um, makes it very interesting. I think, as, as with you, John, I'd probably be in business for quite a long time because it's a, it's, it's a very complicated space, but interesting and important. But also super effective. I mean, w we have the ability now to receive alerts. Anytime someone sends money to a cryptocurrency address that had been previously scraped off the dark web as a payment address, we get an alert about that. We're able to investigate the customer file suspicious activity reports in ways that traditional financial institutions simply couldn't do. And, and we can affirm that in saying that, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of misconception when we're talking about public-private partnership in this space. Uh, we do get suspicious activity reporting from uh, virtual currency businesses, from money service businesses. About We have tens of thousands of suspicious activity reports that are filed uh, on Bitcoin or some other type of convertible virtual currency. And over half of those are filed by the exchangers themselves uh, reporting different indicators and different wallet addresses and valuable sort of cyber indicators that we can use either for our own investigations or that we can provide to law enforcement to support investigations like the Welcome to Video case that we referenced at the top. Uh, one thing I would flag, though, it's not an entirely rosy picture here. I, I think Congressman Foster appropriately pointed out there are, you know, anonymity-enhanced cryptocurrencies that exist that impair the block, that impair tracing in this space. So uh, Congressman mentioned Monero. Um, you know, we took an action against one of these uh, exchanges in 2017 uh, called BTCE, which at the time was one of the worst actors in this space, uh, just completely allowed 95% uh, of all ransomware to go through it. It was uh, uh, Russian sort of Cyprus based all over uh, in that space. We, in conjunction with law enforcement, uh, fined them $110 million for their, uh, for their violations, but in that action, uh, we actually called out uh, one thing that was really important. Uh, they were using a cryptocurrency called Dash uh, in their uh, offering it in exchange, and we actually cited them for not having appropriate anti-money laundering controls in place for offering a product or service that offered anonymity-enhanced features. So our message to exchanges that are offering these types of cryptocurrencies is that you have to have controls in place to be able to mitigate the risks associated with these anonymity-enhanced features. I think those, those principles, that, things about the BTC case, well, first of all, it was, a, it was a offshore, is it not in the U.S. exchange that had U.S. customers, which is one lesson that was learned from that. Um, that enforcement action. If you're doing business in the U.S. or with U.S. customers, you're subject to U.S. law. Um, you know, but I think the other lesson that, you're, that I think we're seeing here in, in many of the enforcement actions that have occurred, which is, you know, some of the similar principles apply. What risk-based programs, right? Knowing your customer, making sure that you can identify suspicious activity, and then um, what I've seen from FinCEN reports is that the number of suspicious activities that have been filed has increased. And, and I think you guys have issued some guidance on the types of information you're looking for in those suspicious activity reports. Um, and just kind of circling back, I think um, a, a lot of, uh, I think what the, the early work that the Blockchain Alliance did um, helped that. I know, and, and for example, with respect to how to write a subpoena that gets you the information that you want rather than, you know, lots and lots of information, I think there was a lot of great work that was done to help educate between um, private sector and public sector on how to, you know, who are the people to serve a subpoena to so that you get the information that you want and then it's an effect, effective law enforcement. Um, and I'm just trying to, so, uh, oh yeah, sure, go ahead, Dick. So I'd like to uh, just follow up on Kevin's comment a little bit regarding Monero and these other privacy coins. I think um, 
there will be unintended consequences of things like the FATF regulations as they get implemented because it will, I am convinced, push more criminal activity to those privacy enhanced coins. Today, what we find is most criminal activity uses the well-known cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum because there's a good brand name. It's easy to buy. There's lots, you can buy them on the street corner. You know, five blocks from here, you can go buy them at a Bitcoin ATM with no ID or, or a fake ID. Um, so it's easy to buy. It's easy to, to cash out. Um, so 95% of what we identify as criminal is really using those um, currencies. As we get more of this de-anonymization, it becomes more like banking, I think an unintended consequence will be that there will be concerted effort to use these privacy-enhanced coins. Um, we've been working on a project w that's funded by DHS, uh, specifically on Monero, um, but there's a lot of work to do because there's Dash and there's Grin and Mimblewimble and there's a whole bunch of other protocols that PhDs in mathematics are actively working on, lots of PhDs. The math behind this stuff is unbelievable. So it's interesting, I mean, as I think privacy coins do address a very specific in some in some cases, a very specific issue, which is just user privacy. You don't want people to know how much you get paid or how much you pay for your utility bill or where your kids go to camp or, you know, those things I think t t typically aren't something that you broadcast publicly, but your bank may have that information and it can be subpoenaed. Um, so I think those are some of the um, tensions with those the privacy coins um, in part. Um, so, uh, uh, Michelle, I don't know if you want to just talk a little bit too. I know everybody else has just about how um, you know the, technolo the technological enhancements have improved the ability to track and trace, and, and how that can be adopted into a compliance program. Yeah. So certainly, as a as a company, um, we have absolutely um, you know implemented the you know all of the technological enhancements <laughs> and in fact um, you know a, a lot of the most popular I mean I'm sitting next to probably the most popular <laughs> blockchain the found you know the CEO of the most popular blockchain analytics tool which is cipher trace um, but there are certainly others out there as well coin firm chain analysis liptic um, and they're all really you know focused on on this this area um, as a company, you know, this is something that, that we really, um, that we really monitor. Um, you know, one of the things that I also just wanted to talk about a little bit is the fact that there are actual um, legislative initiatives right now that are focused on um, enhancements as well. And, um, and I want to say, first of all, thank you to a lot of the, um, the members of Congress that have been really uh, leaning in on these issues. Uh, I think it's much needed in this space. Thank you to Congressman Foster, Demi, thank you, um, Senator Cotton and Kyle, thank you. Um, so we, so certainly a lot of the, the legislation is, is um, that I'm sure most of you have heard about is very focused on the classification of digital assets. And I think that's needed and I think that's great and, um, and that's wonderful because there are a lot of questions about classification. So um, we welcome you know, seeing legislation um, that's pending, um, for example, like the Token Taxonomy Act. But at the same time, I, I think there has been a lot of um, legislative activity in the AML space as well. And a lot of that has focused on technological enhancements even that um, are designed to help um, the government agencies. For example, there's one bill that is called Advancing Innovation to Assist Law Enforcement. And that bill is actually um, focused on requiring FinCEN to use a lot of the these technologies to help FinCEN aid, you know, to aid FinCEN in doing their jobs. So for example, it, um, it encourages FinCEN to use artificial intelligence, it requires um, FinCEN to use um, digital identity technologies, blockchain, and other emerging technologies um, so that they can sort of internalize it and, and conduct a study and do uh, reports to the Senate Banking Committee, my alma mater, um, and make sure that, um, you know, that they're also, um, you know, 
using these technologies um, for, I think, for the benefit of the government. So I think that's a really interesting bill. Um, another one is the, um, it, it's actually um, the FinCEN Improvement Act, um, and um, and and uh, we we all we support uh, we we support all of these bills. Um, so the the FinCEN um, Improvement Act is actually. Uh, it, it requires FinCEN to coordinate um, closely with the foreign regulatory authorities um, and for, yeah, foreign financial intelligence units as well um, to make sure that, that um, FinCEN is aligned with them. So uh, we think that's also a really good idea. I'm looking at Kevin. I'm going to let him comment on all of this when I'm done <laughs> because he may have different thoughts. <laughs> um, but certainly from an industry perspective, we're very much um, in support and in, uh, in favor. Uh, and then the, the last, the last um, I think, interesting sort of uh, bill that's in the AML space is actually um, a Department of Home Homeland Security bill. And that one is um, much more focused on um, individuals and individuals um, to basically do, um, to study whether, for the DHS, to study whether individuals are using blockchain um, and digital currencies for terrorism and other um, illicit activity. Um, so that's another interesting bill. Um, and um, that's actually that's that one has uh, passed the House and is awaiting Senate um, Senate consideration. So so that's um, you know th I would say like there there are different um, uh, initiatives that are floating around on the Hill, um, which I think is which I think is really encouraging in this space. Kevin, I don't know if you want to <laughs> talk about them at all, but. I'm not necessarily in a position to advocate for a particular piece of legislation, but what I can say is, uh, you know, the spirit of a lot of the things you talk about are a lot of what FinCEN is actually working on right now or projects in which we're engaged. So uh, obviously, as the United States Financial Intelligence Unit, uh, one of the critical roles we play is our engagement with foreign financial intelligence units, especially in this space, where we have the opportunity to help them build their capacity to do the types of investigations that we do at FinCEN and that we do domestically. So that's always going to be a priority for us. Um, in terms of our technology and how we use our database, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and those kinds of concepts are absolutely things that are at the foremost of our minds at how we can better use the data that we have uh, to identify illicit activity and stop bad guys. That's always going to be at the forefront of what we're looking at that. So obviously, uh, the spirit of that, uh, we're, we're right there and those are things that we're actively working on. And just to round out what Michelle was saying, uh, you know, there's. Right now, there's 34 blockchain-related bills um, percolating in Congress. There's been a lot of activity um, around blockchain in particular. Um, 16 of those are anti-money laundering related. Um, and then 13 of those um, call for some sort of study into the potential for illicit activity, which is actually down from last year. I think last year, we we're tracking of upwards of 27, calling for a study, which may be too many studies. I feel like one or two good studies might do the trick. but. Um, so, and actually in the NDAA that Michelle was um, mentioning, there's a, a section in there calling on the military, the Department of Defense to conduct um, a study on the military applications um, for blockchain technology. So lots of interesting, and I think proactive um, legislation out there that is, um, like you said, um, you know, it's, it's, it's um, encouraging to see your support there. Um, now going back, to Kevin, what you were saying, just to, you know, maybe, I think blockchain time, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite clear on it, but Last week, was it that FinCEN, the SEC, and the CFTC issued joint guidance um, just on the application of the Bank Secrecy Act generally to industry? I don't know if you want to give maybe just a few comments on yeah. that. Yeah, that, thank you for pointing that out. Um, so I mentioned at the outset sort of one of the big issues that we faced was this idea of jurisdictional arbitrage and companies moving abroad and trying to find weak spots. One of the things we noticed is that uh, companies were also trying to uh, apply a certain degree of regulatory arbitrage and try to classify themselves differently uh, so that they, could, they might be able to avoid certain regulatory requirements domestically. And so basically, uh, it, this, the statement that we put out last week in conjunction, and it was the chairperson of the CFTC, the chairperson of the SEC, and our director uh, at FinCEN, uh, it, it basically had two messages. The first is that 
yes, in fact, the U.S. government agencies actually do talk to each other about this. And I think there's a lot of misconception uh, out there that, you know, people try to say that we're pointing at each other uh, when, in fact, we're, we talk to each other all the time. We're very clear about uh, where we stand and we collaborate before we do something and make uh, statements like this. And then second is, you may be classified as a security, you may be classified as a commodity, uh, your activity may be money transmission. But regardless of where you fall in those categories, and in some circumstances you may wear more than one hat, you're going to have anti-money laundering obligations. So there's no way for you to really uh, you know, apply a, a, a different kind of regulatory standard and get away from your anti-money laundering uh, regulations. Now, CFTC and SEC have a, a, a myriad of other regulations that are in place. John went over some of the ones uh, uh, that state regulators uh, apply many, the SEC and the CFTC has many of those same requirements. But regardless of what category you fall into, you're going to have anti-money laundering obligations in the United States. And that's really the crux of what the statement was getting at. And just to point out, which actually we didn't mention in the federal side, even if you're not a financial services provider, there is just criminal uh, money laundering regulations that apply to everybody, no matter what kind of activity you're engaged in. So there's a lots of... Um, Safety nuts, I think, there for, for law enforcement. But so let me just ask you another quick question then. Trends, anything, you know, as far as an enforcement or compliance obligations that, that you're seeing for this industry? And then I'll open it up to questions from the floor. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so, you know, we've been doing examinations at uh, these types of financial institutions with our delegated examiners from the IRS Small Business Self-Employed Division. Uh, FinCEN's rather small, so we have to delegate our authority uh, to uh, federal agencies to do these kinds of investigations. Uh, examinations, they're routine compliance examinations that try to identify where there's weaknesses. Uh, some of the things that we uh, identified are things that we've already talked about. So one of our biggest hurdles we see are people not uh, putting the appropriate control controls uh, on the products and services they're offering. So exchanges that offer Monero that can't answer the question of who is the person on the other end of that Monero transaction. That's a significant problem. Uh, if you can't answer that question, you can't tell me that that person's not Kim Jong-un or uh, a North Korean actor. Um, the other thing that we sort of see is transactional monitoring. Uh, people are starting to understand that the, when you have a large volume of transactions, uh, the best uh, way to identify suspicious activity is going to be some combination of automated and manual uh, review. Uh, at the beginning, a lot of companies started up and really only had manual review when they were processing uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions a day. Uh, as you might expect, uh, we've found that there's a lot of violations that slip through the cracks uh, and a lot of suspicious activity that goes unreported and things like that. Um, the other thing that I think uh, we see is, uh, which will be no surprise to anyone, uh, you know, the United States has had a travel rule that uh, Dave mentioned in place. Uh, it's been in place in the United States since 2011. Uh, so that's not a new requirement that's been introduced in the United States. Uh, we've seen a lot of violations. It's the number one cited thing on IRS exams, our travel rule record keeping violations. Okay. Well, with that, uh, how about um, any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, Congressman Foster here. Um, could you say a little bit about um, how, you know, with the, the fan of travel rule and just generally, how people are handling the issue of, of I securely identifying the actual participants in a legally traceable way? Uh, because, you know, obviously you give up on that if you have a, um, a pseudonymous uh, currency, uh, unless someone, you know, in order to participate in your network, I guess at the other end of the spectrum, you have Michelle's operation where everyone, you have no anonymous transactions on your network. Every one of them is legally traceable, you know, as a, as a corporation, um, as a regulated corporation. And so how do you handle it? This is an issue not only for, for just moving money, but also for trading. I know that, uh, you know, the CFTC and other uh, trading regulators are very worried about uh, things like what they call wash trades, where you go and you buy a bunch of stuff from yourself under fake names to establish a fake price for that commodity. And this is an ancient, um, ancient problem in fraudulent trading activities and securities and, um, and so on. And so how is that handled and how, how, where are we going to have to go to get it to, to handle the problem of securely uh, authenticating people? 
So I'll take a whack at that. Um, the, the, the first line of defense, of course, is customer identification, having a solid customer identification program that um, uh, allows for you to understand who your customer is. And uh, basically all of the U.S. exchanges are, are pretty much similar to that way. They authenticate a, a, a identification where obviously remote service can't come to a brick and mortar store, but there are technological solutions to that, including validating the ID through sort of non-physical means, uh, uh, capturing an image of the government uh, issued ID, doing facial recognition, those kinds of things to ensure that we actually understand who our customer is. Of course, if my competitor, let's say Coinbase, does the same thing, then any transaction which is traceable on the blockchain, on the public blockchain, will be easily identifiable by law enforcement. In other words, send a, 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 a transfer on behalf of a customer to somebody at Coinbase or to a Coinbase address, law enforcement understands that that exists because they have blockchain tracing tools that allow it, understands that Bittrex has full customer identification, Coinbase has full customer identification, and then um, uh, they can sort of or investigate the transaction that way. What we are missing, which is basically a historical accident as to how the blockchain grew up, is that it, it simply transfers value. It does not transfer identity at the same time. So one of the technological things that we're wrestling with, quite frankly, is how is it that we would uh, do what banks do? Banks have SWIFT. They have been around for hundreds of years. They have international organizations that are able to uh, do the kinds of governance and data security issues to ensure that when you send a wire transfer, for example, it goes to SWIFT as well, so the data itself, the information, identity information, moves at the same time. We're still wrestling with that, quite frankly, and um, uh, but we're making good progress on it because we have a lot of smart minds on it, and hopefully we'll have a solution prior to, um, um, we'll have a solution to it, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think on the, you know, as, uh, as John mentioned, the um, customer identification is key. Now, this thing about who you're sending it to or receiving it from is the next problem. That's going to be the subject of the travel rule conference in November in San Francisco. Um, there's a number of proposals for that uh, to do it securely, to identify the counterparty, meaning the organization that you're sending or receiving money to or from. Um, it does require identification of the organizations as well. So it's not just customer identification, it's verification identification of organizations. Their tr true uh, d domicile, what regulatory uh, regime do they fall under? Do they actually do KYC or can you use a cheesy fake ID to get in? Um, so risk rating the organizations and having a vetting program of the organization so when uh, it's Bittrex sending money to some exchange they've never heard of, they can go look it up and see if they comply and that they can trust the identity information. Now, it does bring up an interesting problem, which I call the sunrise problem, which is the sun doesn't rise at the same time everywhere around the world. Regulation like this will not be enforced and technologically implemented by all these exchanges June 1st of next year. It will take time for this to happen. So there will be this challenge of, which exchanges are in compliance, which ones aren't, oh, that might change next month. So this is one of the topics that really needs to be developed by industry and government. So are anonymous shell corporations allowed to participate in various networks under the rules? This, this is why you have to have vetting. It, under the travel rule, anonymous corporations would not be permitted to, to, uh, to, par to participate. There's a lot of discussion in the risk-based guidance around shell companies um, how to determine whether one is a shell company or one isn't. Yeah, and certainly in the United States, it's not permitted. So any virtual asset provider in the United States is not going to allow shell corporations. But again, it's a big world, so. Kyle. As we sit here today, is the United States the single best place for companies like Ripple or anybody in the digital asset space? Absolutely. I've, no. N no. Is, <laughs> I would say no. I'm a, I've met with about 15 ballpark for-profit uh, companies. I've asked all 15, or however many it was. Strictly business-wise, would you be better off outside the United States? 
commonly hear Singapore, Luxembourg, Switzerland. These are not rogue states. Um, you know, it's the Gates test. Open up the gates, see which way they go. Nobody in Miami ever got in a raft to get to Cuba. Um, so why do we hear all the time that they'd be better off in places like Singapore or Switzerland? I'll tell you why I disagree with that statement. And that's because the FATF rules that just went into place are what you're going to see more broadly adopted around the world. That is the standard by which all of these companies are going to have to hold themselves. They're not going to be able to select a place with weaker AML uh, regulations uh, anymore. So the companies that have already established themselves in the United States that are already complying with these rules are putting themselves in a strategically advantageous position because they're going to be the ones that are already in compliance when all of these foreign companies are trying to struggle to come up to speed or are going to keep trying to hop away until hold out as long as they can. And just remember, if they're doing business with United States persons, I don't care where they're located, they have US anti-money laundering obligations, and if they're not following them, we're going to hold them accountable. And Kevin, so I agree with you, and I think FinCEN has really been a leader in this space. The, the issue that we are seeing as a company is that I think the broader crypto asset framework in the United States does not work. Um, and what I'm talking about is, is um, really related, I think, um, to the classification of digital assets. So there is a lot of questioning about you know, whether something is a security. The SEC issued guidance in April. Um, that talks, it's basically an investment contract analysis um, under the Howey test. And um, I think there are 38 factors. Um, it basically, the, the four-factor test has been expanded to 38 factors. Uh, so there has been some uh, regulatory, I guess, confusion. And I think there is really um, much, a, a, a lot of clarity is really needed. Uh, I think it's very interesting because Commissioner Peirce in uh, referring, SEC Commissioner Peirce in referring to that, that April guidance, she called it you know, a Jackson Pollock painting approach. Um, so, so I think that confusion has been very difficult for the industry. While you know, we understand and we appreciate that the SEC is trying to issue, issue guidance, um, it, it, you know, it's been difficult. Um, I do think the CFTC under Chairman Heath Tarbert's leadership has been um, a, a great. Um, we're, we've been very encouraged to see that um, he's really, um, you know, highlighting and, and um, raising the importance of, um, you know, regulation and in this space and um, continuing with Chairman, um, former Chairman uh, Chris Giancarlo's um, initiatives. And just, Michelle, and to kind of follow on your question, too, because I don't think your question, when I've heard this discussed, it's not necessarily specific to AML or FinCEN or any kind of criticism right. there. It's, right. it's broader to what Michelle is saying, which is um, every agency in the United States is figuring out how do we regulate this. And those are important conversations that must take place, and you know, if needed, enforcement action should happen. But what we're not talking about here in the U.S. is how to promote this industry and this technology and the benefits of it. How, the, how this technology benefits law enforcement, how it benefits businesses, how it helps consumers interact in a digital age. Um, all of these things are not as focused at, at, at leadership levels as they, they should be and as other countries are. Like you said, Singapore, Canada, Japan. I mean, UK. They, I yeah. mean, they're all yeah, getting UK. it right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, come on, US, we can do this. <laughs> so, Amy, Michelle, the, your answer was no. Is as we sit here today, is the United States the single most Correct. attractive place? Your answer is no, too, right? The um, single best. Yeah, I don't think that the U.S. is as accommodating as other countries. They're enforcing and uh, not enforcing, they're encouraging companies to come and giving them proactive environments to engage in. I've heard so, people who write regulations think that we are the best. I've never heard anybody who has to comply with regulations think we're the best. There's a reason why companies have moved from the United States to Switzerland. I mean, regardless of what you think of Libra, there's a reason why they're setting up shop in Switzerland. There's a clear regulatory framework. They've stated an actual intent to establish a crypto valley. I mean, FINMA is a real regulator. Uh, it's, I mean, this is not regulatory arbitrage. It's just that it's clear and they're friendly. And, and they don't have the federalism concerns that we have. And the idea that you have uh, 50 different state regulators as well as several regulators within the federal government is one that's uh, you know quite difficult if you're attempting to enforce innovation, because at some point it's going to be the lowest common denominator. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. 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 Right. 
small room. Thank you all uh, for the presentation today. So we talked earlier about mathematician scientists. We got a lot of them on it. Quantum computing. A lot of the anonymity, the way I understand it, of how cryptocurrencies run is run on encryption. And quantum computing does potentially propose doing away with it as we know it, making it impossible to stay anonymous. No, you said, so tell me, it, how am I to understand when we get there? Because it will just be a matter of when we master quantum computing and make it to where you could run a back channel on encryption and know where some, you know, where something came from. Am I to understand that to be what's going to change this industry? And then also, um, a second question, just earlier on, and sorry, it's on a completely different field, but we talked earlier about industry compliance, working with law enforcement. Just broad scope, I understand this industry to come from a place of very strong libertarianism, like we don't want the government at all near us. So how am I to understand that this industry will always be cooperative uh, with government when it's very much born out of this idea that like we are separate and apart, I don't want the government near me. But thank you all again for the presentation I'll, today. I'll take the first one. Yeah. So um, there are a classification of quantum resistant encryption algorithms that uh, many researchers in the mathematics field uh, have been working on for quite some time. NIST has projects to validate those algorithms. Um, they're based on something called lattice theory. Uh, now, those can help protect future cryptographic systems because remember, like it's not just Bitcoin that uses cryptography. Every single secure communication we ever do requires cryptography. Um, it cannot protect you from decrypting stuff from the past, but it can certainly be used, quantum resistance can be used to keep future looking systems secured from, uh, from quantum attacks. Quantum attacks also only work on certain types of encryption algorithms. That's my first point. Um, so there's a lot of math going on to, to resist it. The second uh, thing I would say is, it's not universally accepted that quantum computing is going to break encryption in our lifetimes. The, the progress that Google has made is on some very artificial, simple problems. Um, there's a lot of investment going on at IBM and other companies as well, but when you look at the material science of it, and you look at the errors that are generated with it, it is not clear that error correction techniques can actually be developed that will allow it to scale to the level that you'd be able to attack uh, like a you know, 4890, uh, 4, 4,000 bit um, RSA key, for example. Uh, so it, there's a lot of scientists who would argue that that's not actually gonna happen in our lifetime just due to the physical properties and error. But if I'm wrong, Let's adopt quantum resistant algorithms anyway. <laughs> Look, at least in the United States, there, there were early adopters, I would agree, that were sort of anti government in nature. Um, but this is a mature uh, industry within the United States. It understands that it is part of the financial industry, it is regulated as financial institutions. Uh, people like me and people who run the compliance departments and the legal departments of all the US based crypto exchanges are very serious people who have very serious uh, jobs in ensuring that we are compliant with US law. And there's no going back from that. So, yeah, and I would just add um, I think, you know. Ripple, obviously, as a company, I mean, we're heavily regulated. Um, but in addition, I mean, if, if you even use myself, as me as an example, I'm a former SEC lawyer. I was a lawyer on the Senate Banking Committee. I was a regulatory analyst at FINRA. So like, I mean, these are, these are all like really mainstream regulatory jobs. So I wouldn't consider myself to be in that, that area, so yeah. And, and look, what are you ultimately trying to get at by using this technology? People are trying to get scalability, right? They want to be able to build this out. If you're actually trying to create a scalable system, you're not talking about a small subset of you know, libertarian-minded individuals. You're trying to capture the consumer base that are the everyday regular consumer in the United States. Those people are going to be uh, more comfortable in a space that's going to look at a, a space where they know that their money is not being used to facilitate you know, 
uh, the North Korean regime or something like that. They want a, a, a traditional space that exists in this that has the controls in place uh, that the government's putting there. Well done. Okay. Well, I want to thank each of our panelists for lending um, their expertise. As you can all see, there are a lot of um, brilliant minds who are spending a, a lot of time and resources to think through these important challenges that impact the blockchain space. Um, Kevin, thank you for letting us um, uh, uh, beat you up a little bit. I think in all fairness, some of the critical comments were actually outside of FinCEN's jurisdiction, just to highlight that. But we really appreciate being able to have that open dialogue with you and FinCEN. That's really important to being able to find solutions. I'm also super proud of all of our members, Bitrix, um, Ripple, and CypherTrace. Um, it's really amazing to have such great companies that on their own time and expense are not only here today to share with you their work in this space, but have put just a significant amount of resources into making sure that companies that want to operate in the space in a lawful way are doing so and have the resources um, and, and, the, and the programs uh, to accomplish those goals. Um, and Amy, also, thank you so much um, for organizing today's session and for moderating such um, a uh, successful and um, interesting conversation. Um, and also want to thank you um, to Congressman Foster again um, for sponsoring um, today's discussion. And thanks to each of you. Um, we have um, a number of resources on the back table. Um, and if these um, uh, topics are something you'd like to take a deeper dive in, um, feel free to reach out to us at the chamber um, and or any of our members. And um, we'd be happy to spend some time with you in your offices to, to uh, continue the conversation. Um, so thank you.